Physics is in a crisis. To be more precise, theoretical physics. It's full of wonderful and beautiful theories. Theories that have cost us tens of billions of dollars around the globe. Theories that explain the most important questions in physics and open doors to places we've never been before. The problem? We have no experimental evidence to support any of them. So the question comes, should we change the scientific method? Before you tell me what the scientific method is exactly, how come this is even an option? So who in the world came up with this idea that how about we change it? Well, I read a book called Lost in Math by Sabine Hossenfelder. Is science coming to an end? And she wrote about how she went to a conference and heard Richard Dalwood speak on adjusting the scientific method to better suit our contemporary problems. He literally has a book on it called String Theory and the Scientific Method. Dalwood gives three non-empirical reasons to make a theory legit. Number one, no alternatives argument. The idea that if there are no other plausible explanations or theories available, the existing theory gains in credibility. Okay, so the fact that there are no better ideas that exist, therefore, this theory becomes more credible. That's reason number one. Just like string theorists, they, they say, ah, that's the only theory that gets as close as possible to explaining nature, therefore we should use it. Number two, meta-inductive argument. The success of a theory in a domain similar to or overlapping with another theory can lend credibility to both. When two theories overlap with each other, so one theory naturally has another theory in it, like for example with supersymmetry and string theory, right? These two theories kind of need each other to exist. So it depends. If my theory is proven experimentally, then it gives your theory a little bit more of credibility and vice versa. Number three, an expected explanatory coherence. A theory's ability to explain phenomena that weren't initially considered in its development can increase its credibility. So they weren't like trying, I don't know, explain black holes, for example, in the theory initially, and it happens to explain it somehow, therefore it's more credible. Einstein's theory of general relativity. When he developed it, he was not thinking about black holes. He didn't dream right. about black holes. Schwarzschild found a solution. Yeah. And Einstein, even Einstein, he was skeptical in the beginning. In the end, he predicted something that he didn't intend to. Right. And in my opinion, it gives even more credibility because he was right in the end. Dalwood suggests that these non-empirical forms of theory confirmation should be more widely recognized and formalized within the scientific method, especially in fields like high energy physics, where experimental verification faces some practical challenges. As science probes areas that are increasingly remote from direct observation, the early universe, black holes, extra dimensions, the traditional emphasis on empirical data is something that maybe we should uh, reconsider. In the absence of experimental tests, waiting for technological advancements that may or may not come could slow down scientific progress. Yeah, obviously this sparks a debate because if a theory is really pretty or that technology is not advanced enough to prove it, both of these things are not enough to say, yeah, therefore let's change everything we've been doing so far. Also, that raises the question that Sabine did in her book as well. Do we philosophize things into existence now? Yeah, that's exactly the problem with it. So the scientific method is composed of many different things, but basically there are a few steps that characterize it very clearly. One, you have a problem. Two, you have a form of hypothesis. Three, this hypothesis is confirmed by observation or you adjust it and observe it again. And you have the results. So far, this has worked perfectly for physics. Yeah, I mean, obviously I understand that technology is not yet advanced enough to prove things like supersymmetry or string theory. We are way more advanced theoretically than we are experimentally. But I suppose if they did push for larger and larger particle colliders, there should have been some hint of results. The first most notable criticism of the way we study physics came in 1962 by Thomas Kuhn, actually six years before string theory was even proposed. He doesn't argue for a total change in the scientific method in a traditional sense. But he does say that discoveries in physics shouldn't be so clear cut. They aren't linear. So for centuries, you need to understand historically, the way physicists navigated the field was through Newtonian physics. According to Newton, space was a fixed stage where the events of the universe unfolded and time ticked away uniformly everywhere. This framework was incredibly successful, explaining a wide range of phenomena from the motion of planets to tides. Then along came Einstein with the theory of relativity, asking questions like, 
What if space-time itself could bend and stretch? What if the flow of time wasn't uniform, but could speed up or slow down depending on gravity and velocity? When experiments proved Einstein's theories right, this became known as the paradigm shift, which wasn't just a small update or a correction for physics. It was a fundamental different way of understanding the world. Kuhn then emphasized that scientific progress is not a slow and steady accumulation of facts. He argues that normal science operates within the confines of the current paradigm, but when anomalies arise, or observations that cannot be accounted for, it can lead to a crisis and the eventual shift to a new paradigm. Well, everything he's saying doesn't sound particularly new to me. Actually, it makes complete sense. It already happened. And this is something obvious for us now, but it was not back then for physicists. They really saw the field as something linear. Of course, his ideas were very criticized. And then philosophers took his theory and started to refine it so that it could be more specific and more precise. But when was it that someone actually said, hey, our technology isn't advanced enough and it probably won't be for a long time, therefore, let's accept it as it is? It was a whole process. One specific case scenario that started this line of thinking was that of Karl Popper and his theory of falsification. Falsification is a reaction against the traditional view of science. So he's saying that we don't need empirical evidence to prove a theory? Not quite. He's saying that to disprove a theory, you need empirical evidence against it. And if you don't, it remains a legitimate theory. Okay, so I need to find experimental proof that contradicts my theory in order for the theory to be proven false. But if I don't find any proof that contradicts it so far, like I look for proof, 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 and none of it contradicts the theory, therefore the theory is true. Yes, Popper argued that no amount of empirical data could ever conclusively prove a theory because future observations might always contradict it. Okay, look, there is something in mathematics called proofs by contradiction. And there is a group of mathematicians who believe that all proofs should be using contradiction. So they don't even accept, for example, the axiom of choice in mathematics. Anyway, this is another story. But the thing is that it's a very limited way of proving things. And it's a very slow way of advancing mm -hmm. in any field. It's interesting as an idea. It's just not practical. And again, we have a critic of the theories I told you, named Emery Lakatos. So he disagrees with both Popper's falsification and Kuhn's paradigm shift model. With Popper's because falsification is too simplistic. And I personally agree. I don't think that a theory should be just abandoned at the first sign of contradiction. Instead, physicists often refine their theories, adjust their hypothesis, or even question the reliability of the conflicting data itself. So Lakatos proposed scientific research programs. There are more things here, but I'm not going to go into detail, such as the division of these groups and how they need to operate and all this thing. The main line of thinking is that whichever research group is most to least fruitful in results, the more or less they should be invested in, in whatever sense, time, funding, intellectual capital, and so on. Over time, some of these programs will give significant theoretical insights and empirical confirmations, which is a positive return, while others may face insurmountable problems or fail to progress, which is a negative return. Okay, I see what you did there. You're saying that string theory already pulled a lot of resources financial, intellectual, whatever. And it's about time that we slow down investing so much into the theory. Yes, I would. You know it could be true. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that it doesn't make sense to build a larger particle collider. For example, we're talking about billions of dollars here. Maybe it's time to find something else. If you've been enjoying this video, please give it a thumbs up. And please subscribe and comment what you think about this. But actually, this is not even the biggest of problems. If you want to know the biggest of problems in physics nowadays, click in this video right here. See you there.